Okay, we can go ahead and get started. For my new people and as a reminder, my name is Marissa Robinson. I use the pronoun she, her, hers, and I serve as an assistant director of leadership development. As always, I'm excited to welcome you to this week's session. Before we get started, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the continued difficulties and injustices people are facing within the United States. Um, these times are hard and can be exhausting. And I wanna let you know that it's okay not to be okay. I know for me this week, I wasn't okay. Um, when things are difficult though, I really try to focus on what I'm grateful for. Um, I hope you all know that I am grateful for all of you and for the opportunity to be here with you for these past four Sundays. So um, I also just wanted to mention that, I also wanted to commend you commend you for showing up and taking the time to educate yourselves to be able to make this a movement and not just a moment. So thank you for joining us, whether this is your fourth session or this is your first session, we're really happy to have you here. So with that, I am going to pass it over to Alex to introduce our speakers for today. Awesome, thank you, Marissa. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Shiloh. I'm a football student athlete at Texas A&M University Commerce and I represent uh, Division II National SAC and I'm the chair of uh, Division II SAC. Um, excited to be here with you guys today. A lot of you probably don't know me, um, but I get to represent 120,000 student athletes. I get to represent you guys at the national level uh, for all student athletes in Division II. And one thing I wanna leave you with uh, before I introduce our speakers uh, is why it's so important to use your platform as a student athlete for change. As you can see right now, there's a lot going on in our country right now. There's a lot going on with uh, going on in Wisconsin, what's going on in Portland, uh, what's going on in your city. Uh, it might seem like a lot and a lot to tackle, uh, but one thing I wanna encourage you with is that you can start wherever you are and start making change. I can't make change to a billion people in the United States. I can't make change in Wisconsin or Portland, but in Commerce, Texas, which is about an hour east of Dallas, Texas, I can change 10,000 lives in my city. I can change the 10,000 lives on my campus. We don't have to tackle the entire world, but we can make effective change in our cities that can just sprinkle throughout people that we come in contact with throughout the world. And so I wanna uh, encourage you with that. You're a student athlete for only a certain period of time. It comes and goes. You have a platform that's gonna come and go. You got a four year time clock, four to five year time clock where this platform will be gone. Everyone's eyes are on you right now. You have a platform that's so heightened where you can stand up and people will listen to you. And at the national office, Bradley Keller, you'll meet him later. But when we're speaking at the national office, we have eyes and it's ears all on us. We're speaking on behalf of you guys on your campus, in your community, you have eyes and ears all on you. You can make change in your city, on your campus right now. So I encourage you, utilize the resource you have and your platform as a student athlete to spread what you're passionate about and make change in the area that you're in right now. And I'm so passionate about that and I'm so encouraged and excited uh, for our guests today and the word that they're gonna share with us. Um, and so I'm excited to introduce our guest speakers today from Athletes for Hope, uh, Ivan Blumberg, uh, Suzanne Potts, and Jason Belinke. And so Athletes for Hope is a nonprofit organization founded in 2006 by several high profile uh, philanthropy minded athletes such as Andre Agassi, Muhammad Ali, Mia Hamm, Jeff Gordon, Warwick Dunn, Alonzo Mourning, and Jackie Joyner Kersey. So AFH, Athletes for Hope for short, is a leading sports philanthropy organization and their mission is to educate, encourage, and assist athletes in their efforts to contribute to community and charitable causes to increase public awareness of those efforts and to inspire others to do the same. So Ivan is currently the CEO for Athletes for Hope, and he has spent the majority of his career representing athletes. Ivan served as the general counsel and managing director of ProServe and was a member of the board. After ProServe was acquired by SFX Clear Channel, Ivan became the president of athlete representation and managed the representation of over 750 athletes across nine sports. He's a graduate of Hobart College and graduate of George Washington University, of Washington University, excuse me, School of Law. Next, uh, our next guest speaker is Suzanne uh, Potts. She's the Athletes for Hope National Director. She has a broad nonprofit and foundation experience working as a social worker, capacity builder, and funder for over 19 years. Suzanne oversees AFH University program, connecting student athletes to charitable opportunities across various communities nationwide. She also manages all the measurement and evaluation for Athletes for Hope. She has served as an executive director for the Autism Society of Texas an adjunct assistant professor at the University of Texas Austin School of Social Work and faculty advisor at George Washington University Sports Philanthropy Executive Certificate Program. 
She is passionate about diversity and inclusion in all areas of community and work. And our third guest speaker for AFH is Jason Belinke. He has been a part of Athletes for Hope since the first day it opened its doors in 2006. Over the last 14 years, Jason has worked with hundreds of professional Olympic and coll collegiate athletes and countless charities and helping to bring them together to positively impact communities around the world. In his current role as Chief Operating Officer, Jason oversees the day-to-day -day management of AFH and key strategic partnerships. Jason is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania Wharton School and Johns Hopkins University Graduate School of Education. I'm so, so excited and I look forward to learning from each of you and our guest speakers during this session. So please join me in welcoming our guests from Athletes for Hope, Suzanne, Ivan, and Jason. Thank you, Alex. Really appreciate it, bud. Um, my name is Ivan Blumberg. As Alex um, suggested, I'm the CEO of Athletes for Hope um, and have been so um, since the day we opened 14 years ago. Um, so a couple quick things before we um, dive in. Um, first and foremost, um, I want to both thank and commend Marissa, DD, the NCAA. This is the, the last session um, of four sessions. And um, as both Didi and Alex referenced, um, these are difficult times. And um, the NCAA has taken this on head on and made these educational opportunities available to each of you. And you guys, on the other hand, have really leaned in. You've taken many of you for Sunday evenings um, and made this a major priority in your life. Um, I spent 25 years representing professional athletes. And for the longest time, I was convinced that professional athletes were the ultimate role model. They, um, they had the ability to earn a living doing something they were passionate about. What better thing can you do than that? Um, but in the last seven or eight years, as we've developed our Athletes for Hope University program, um, I've changed my perspective. And uh, I'm a father. I have three children that are um, college graduates. But when if they were 10, 11, or 12 years old, and they could look up to anyone right now, um, honestly, folks, I, I'd like them to look up to you all. Um, you, you guys are excelling in the classroom. You are excelling on the athletic field. Um, and as demonstrated by these last four weeks, and frankly, Alex's words, um, you are leaning in to your communities. Um, you're leaning into what you're passionate about. You're willing to take on the education, have the difficult conversations. So um, you should be proud of yourself. You should take what you're learning and you should apply it every day um, for the rest of your lives. So um, very quickly, we're going to take you through uh, a quick overview of who we are. We're, with Jason and Suzanne's help, we're going to go through a series of interactive exercises um, I encourage you guys to be um, open, honest, and um, participate in any way you want. Um, we're going to discuss some opportunities for engagement, for actual ways to lean in, um, and then we're going to talk about next steps. Um, so if you guys sat in my office, um, you would see three pictures. Uh, the picture in the middle says all that is necessary for the forces of evil to prevail in the world is for enough good men or women to do nothing. I've had that picture for 35 years uh, and I see it every single day. Um, if you look to the left of that picture, uh, you'd actually see a picture of Muhammad Ali, me, and my son. Um, Muhammad Ali was one of our original founding athletes. He is sort of the godfather of Athletes for Hope. And for the first four or five years of our existence, as I traveled around the country doing workshops for the NBA and the NFL and Major League Baseball and Olympic organizations, the champ came with me. Um, and he'd walk into a room full of professional basketball players. At, at that point in his life, um, his Parkinson's had developed to the point where he really couldn't talk. So he sat in a chair, usually with sunglasses on, didn't say a word, 
and he spoke volumes. I might as well have been a potted plant in that room uh, because for professional Olympic and now college athletes, he was the ultimate example of using his platform to take on difficult issues. And when he did it, it I trust me because I'm old, um, it was not popular. Um, when Muhammad Ali gave up the most important three years of his boxing career to fight a war that he didn't believe in, it was not a popular position to take, and he didn't care. Um, he did what he believed was right. He used his celebrity to make the world a better place. When he retired as a boxer, he spent the remainder of his life fighting issues of social justice um, and issues of hunger throughout the world. Um, to the right of my um, the center picture is a picture of Arthur Ashe. Um, if we were doing this in person, I'd ask you guys how many people knew who Arthur was. And incredibly, um, I think typically about 5% of the audience knows. Um, Arthur Ashe was an African-American tennis player who grew up in Richmond, Virginia. He was a black dude playing a white person sport in the South. Um, he overcame all of that to become the number one tennis player in the world, to win Wimbledon, to win the US Open. And that has absolutely nothing to do with why his picture is in my office. He was my client. He was my friend. Um, he was a mentor in incredible ways. Um, and in the early 90s, um, there were five of us in the world that knew that Arthur had been diagnosed with HIV. Um, he had a heart ailment. He got a blood transfusion. And incredibly, in the 90s, they didn't screen blood for AIDS, and he contracted HIV. Um, it was a well-kept secret because in the early 90s, people just didn't talk about it. On a Tuesday afternoon, I got a phone call from a journalist, the New York Times. She said, look, we found out that Arthur was HIV positive. We're going to go to press with it, but I want to give you a few days out of respect for him and you. I hung up the phone. I called Arthur on the next phone line told him what was going on. He said, don't move. Um, he was in New York. He got on the next plane, flew down to Washington. He walked into my office and he said, look, man, um, this was not my intent, but um, now that this is going to become public, you and I need to figure out a way to take what's happening to me and use it to help people that are dealing with HIV. And I, I literally get chills every time I tell this story because it takes me back to that moment where my friend was dying um, and there was no known cure. And all he could think about was how to use his position in the world to address an issue. Um, um, we put our heads together. We went to um, the USTA and we convinced them to take the day before the US Open, um, a Sunday, and turn it into um, Arthur Ashe AIDS Awareness Day. We um, filled a stadium. We went to CBS and they agreed to televise an exhibition. Um, every tennis player wore an AIDS awareness patch. Um, and before we know it, we had an event that was not about tennis. We had 19,000 people in a stadium. We had 6 million people watching on television and it was about a cause. Um, so these two gentlemen have used their celebrity, their place in the world. The day before that event, the very first time I called Arthur to ask him some questions and he was sitting in front of the South African embassy about to be arrested because he was there to fight against apartheid um, in South Africa. So he understood it. He saw a world bigger than himself. And it's sort of the, um, the bedrock of what Athletes for Hope is all about. Um, finding ways to use who and what you are to make the world a better place. Okay, um, real quick. So um, Alex covered a lot of this, but um, we are an organization of over 7,000 athletes founded by some pretty amazing folks. Um, we are, uh, we call ourselves cause Gnostic. So we're not about a particular cause. We are about what you as athletes are about. We help you figure out what you care about, and then we help connect you to um, those causes. We, um, everything we do is based around equality, inclusion, and diversity. Um, and every community that we work in, for the most part, are underserved communities. That's what we do. We connect athletes 
to causes. Uh, we launched a major um, COVID response where we had athletes do um, videos for um, underserved kids at home. Um, we have had more response to that than anything we've ever done. So real quick, what do we do? We educate athletes about community service. They tell us what they're interested in. We connect them. We give the teams a choice. So we never tell an athlete, here's a cause, let's figure out how to do it. Um, and then lastly, we recognize you guys because we believe that as role models, if we talk about the great work that athletes are doing, it will inspire others to do the same. Um, we're at a bunch of colleges, universities uh, throughout the country that are listed here on the sheet. Um, and we tend to add two to three universities every single year. So um, it's, it's a challenging time. I couldn't agree with Marissa and Alex more, um, but um, let's all lean in together um, and use this education um, um, and make sure this is um, a movement and not a moment. Um, Jason, I'll hand it over to you. All right. <clears throat> uh, so thank you, Ivan, for giving a description about Athletes for Hope. Uh, this is the part that uh, we hope all of you will engage as much as possible. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're all in a really tough time here, and I don't think the word hope has ever been more pertinent uh, to what everybody's going through. Um, so when you think of that word hope, um, what is the meaning of hope to you? A vision for the future? Having faith? Optimism? Something to look forward to? Definitely resonates in this time. Positivity, uh, faith in the future. Hope means believing. Uh, opportunities for change, yeah, across a variety of spectrums, really important. Um, it's seeing the future in others. And believing in love and change, those are awesome comments and opportunity. Uh, thinking about your journey to get to this point, you know, and, and where you are now in life. Who has given you hope? Just let that sink in for a second. Fellow athletes, your faith, coaches, grandparents, teammates, family, a lot of coaches and teammates and family here, peers, parents, mentors, really good one. Doctors, friends and family, yeah, particularly now, um, mm -hmm. doctors for sure, siblings, People sharing their hardship stories, absolutely, and activists. Okay, um, and you know, kind of bringing this full circle now, are there times in your life when you have given others hope? Showing it's possible to earn what you work for? Yep. Defying the odds, really good one. When you're sharing wisdom with others, helping your friends that are struggling, uh, standing up for your beliefs, Helping train and tutor children, really good one. Getting back up when you fall down. Encouraging someone when they're ready to give up. Yep, showing kids that hard work will pay off. Uh, helping them believe in their own ability. And youth coaching and tutoring, right. So yeah, there's a lot of similar themes here that you know, you're believing in others just like people believed in you in getting to this point. And I uh, saw another great comment and showing support and interest in others just by being you. And, you know, this was alluded to by Alex in terms of the incredible platform you have as a college athlete, just by being you in the position that you're in, you are giving others hope. You are an example of mm -hmm. somebody that's worked very hard and has overcome obstacles, although they might be different for everybody. Um, that wherever you are, you do not know what the impact is that you're having on others just as a result of being where you are right now. So we're going to transition to another interactive exercise here called Agree, Disagree, Unsure. Some of you may have done this in the past. Uh, we just want to be clear in terms of ground rules that there is no right or wrong answer to these questions. So they were purposely created so there can be some dialogue around them. And that is really the purpose, just to create the dialogue around some important topics that you wouldn't normally discuss outside of this setting. So we're gonna do two of them. Um, the first one is a statement, all college athletes have an obligation to give back to their communities. We're getting a lot of agrees here. Mm -hmm. 
Um, usually, I would I would say it's a, a little closer to a 50-50 split, but uh, clearly that speaks to the passion in the room about people feeling like they need to give back. Mm -hmm. um, so that's great. Right now we have 76% agree, 11% disagree, 13% unsure. Um, roughly three fourths of you agreed. Um, so we're gonna start with the agree side. I see a comment from Sarah that community cheers us on. That's a great example. Yep, our community does a lot for us. It's the least you can do, okay? To get to where you were, other people helped you. You're in a position of privilege that people have dreamed of. Um, without community, you wouldn't have support. Um, and your community is your future. Um, give back to people who supported you along the journey. Give back to people who are always in the stands cheering you on. Yeah, that's powerful. Okay. Um, disagree side. Why do you disagree? Student athletes shouldn't have anything they should do outside of school. It should be encouraged. Um, putting it on a crowded plate isn't fair. Really good point. Yep, you're, we, we saw one, our community has a damaged trust with our athletic department. Not all communities show support um, and obligation doesn't seem like the right word. Uh, we, you know, we, all, we often hear a lot about um, it being a moral obligation, you know, not necessarily just athletes. Okay. Um, all college athletes have a responsibility to give back to their communities. Does that change your point of view? Okay, a lot of the time, it does not really change the point of view. Usually responsibility we hear is pretty similar to, to obligation. And if we transition this one more time to all college athletes have an opportunity to give back to their communities. Does that resonate with everybody here? <laughs> okay, rapid fire yes is here, it's great. So. I think, you know, we can debate whether obligation is something that people feel should be a reason you give back or it's too strong of a word. But I think everyone clearly from your comments can agree that you do have this incredible opportunity with the position that you're in. And it's up to you to seize that opportunity and make a difference in the community. I mean, Athletes for Hope can help you do that. So we're going to do one more of these exercises. Statement is, the more well-known of a college athlete you are, the bigger the impact you will have when giving back. Let that sink in for a moment. We had 44% agree, 38% disagree, and 17% unsure. So agrees, why do you agree that the more well-known of a college athlete you are, the bigger the impact you'll have when giving back? Naturally, bigger the audience you have, the more people you'll reach, okay? More impact with a bigger audience. Seeing a lot of, a lot of the bigger reach, bigger numbers. More spotlight on you. Might be easier starting out, but in the long run, if you're persistent, you can make a huge impact, okay? Being in D3, getting less publicity. Bigger can give more opportunities. That's a really good one. Disagree side, why do you disagree with this statement? I just saw one being less well known isn't a limiting factor. Okay, so a community in need will not value it more if you're more well known or not. Okay, working towards a cause is really what determines the impact. Action creating an impact. Popularity can help, but it's more on the action. Impact comes from what you do and it's based on effort. Less well-known can have a huge impact for a smaller audience. We've heard that a lot over the years. Yep, your name has nothing to do with how you can touch someone's life. These are awesome comments. Helping in your community will be valued regardless of how well-known you are. So again, I think we've, we've hit on a lot of the main points. I wanna give the unsures an opportunity here. If you feel like you've been swayed one way or the other, Okay, still unsure because the impact is a subjective measure. Yeah, we, we've heard that a lot. You know, that it can, it can be helpful also to be famous and have a wider net, 
But at the same time, we hear on the disagree side that you can still have a huge impact, you know, reaching maybe a smaller number of people, but perhaps you have more time and energy to reach those people on a deeper level. Um, seeing some disagrees now. Um, so the bottom line is it, the takeaway from this exercise is that it can help to have a wider reach, uh, but it is not necessary to be able to impact somebody's life. And to a point earlier that we heard, the impact is subjective and that either side can have an impact if they commit themselves to it. Uh, with that said, uh, we're gonna transition over to an exercise around movements. Suzanne, take it away. So I'm excited to talk to you about effective movement. So we thought we'd take a minute and really think about what is an effective movement? How do we define it? Um, and how do we know one when we see it? So these are four examples that we found that were compelling for very different reasons. The ice bucket challenge is one on the top left there. That is a um, remarkable fundraiser and awareness raising campaign that the ALS Association uh, started a few years ago. And um, I'm sure a lot of you participated or knew people that posted it on social media. It was kind of a fun way to engage people in a kind of medical uh, model of an organization dealing with uh, Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS. The Me Too movement there on the right um, it's supporting survivors of sexual violence and they took their cause to light a couple years ago in 2017. They connected survivors to resources, raised awareness and dollars, and really just created positive lasting effect around a really difficult topic. Um, on the left at the bottom, Black Lives Matter. Again, we're seeing this every day now. Um, this has now become a global phenomenon uh, uh, organizations working to raise awareness and funds and resources and just empower and positively impact people to support, um, you know, black families all across the globe. Um, and it's got tremendous power now because of not only their visibility, um, but also the people that are connected to it. Um, and then finally, rock the vote. We're going to be talking about voting again in a few minutes with our, our friends at RISE. This campaign really is just about getting young people to get out and vote. And it was started more than 30 years ago. So it's had a long history of being a movement and they raise funds and awareness. So it's been a really effective campaign for a lot of reasons. I wanna ask though, when you think about effective movements, what, what is one word that comes to mind like that stands out for you that makes it effective? Unity, good, thank you. So visibility, passion, great examples. Um, I'm seeing a lot about leadership, people that are strong leaders, right? Change, momentum. Yes, exactly. So simple. That's a great one. We're going to talk about that as well. So there's a lot of things, right? It was almost overwhelming when we started looking at how would you define an effective movement? Connection, ability to connect. Those are all huge um, examples that people are thinking of differently now, especially in this time of COVID to figure out how to connect with one another if we're not gonna be in person. I see empathy and longevity, right? So thinking across all of those things, we put some examples of key qualities of effective movements. We try to just sum it all down. Honestly, there's so many um, incredible pieces. This is kind of our top 10 that we pulled from all the data and research that's out there. But the ability to vision and frame the topic, right? To quickly jump into talking about what your purpose is and sharing that with others. Um, recruitment and connect, which I know a couple of you mentioned, recruiting people, getting them involved in your cause. I mean, for the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge, for example, maybe not as many people know someone who have ALS, but so many people were able to jump on board and quickly move um, to support it. So they made it easy to connect, right? Commitment, authenticity, um, all of these things are key characteristics of an effective movement. And I what is it that moves you? What cause or charity are you passionate about that you want to get involved with? We work with athletes at the pro and Olympic and student athlete level all day long. And there we have almost as many probably causes and partners in that space because we have so many great athletes and, and partners that want to connect. And so we're constantly learning about new things. So when you think about what you can do, 
take this action plan with you as an opportunity to start thinking about what are your goals? What are some of your talking points? How could you bring people to your cause um, and get connected in that way? So we don't have a ton of time to talk about it. I'm really excited to move along to the next piece of this, which is kind of our philosophy. We call it our causeway. And I'm gonna have Ivan talk about why this is so important to us. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, so um, this is where it all sort of comes together, which is um, to think about your own individual, personal, philanthropic journey. Um, it's a journey that starts whatever day you decide it's going to start, and it lasts for the rest of your life. Um, we developed this about 12 years ago um, with McKinsey, and um, it's now um, a roadmap that many of the leagues, including the NBA, have adopted and used to communicate with their athletes. So I'm going to take you through it. I want you to think about it from your own personal perspective. So step number one um, is to educate yourself. And you guys um, are doing that right this very minute. Um, you've been doing it um, um, either formally through these types of sessions or informally in your own way as you educate yourselves about causes that you care about and about what we consider to be smart sports philanthropy. If you're gonna do something, let's maximize our impact, right? Let's use our time efficiently and smartly. So step one, let's educate ourselves. We're doing that. Step two is what we refer to as discovery. Discovery is where you literally figure out what you care about. Um, we do an exercise um, with athletes where we ask athletes what they're passionate about. And 50% of the athletes in the room have no idea. And that doesn't make them insensitive or uncaring people. It makes them normal. They just haven't actually connected to something that matters to them. So we take you guys through a discovery exercise and allow you to figure out on your own, in your own time, what you care about. Now we've educated you, you've figured out what you care about, and the next step is then to connect to causes. Um, you may have multiple causes that you care about, three, four, five. Um, we wanna make sure that you're connecting to organizations that are doing great work, you're able to dip your toe into the work of those organizations, learn about them, get comfortable with them, and at some point, narrow the scope of your interest from maybe three, four, or five organizations or causes to one or two, at which point you're going to move from connection to engagement. And in engagement, you're going to get more involved. You're going to learn more about that particular cause. You're going to spend more time. You're going to roll up your sleeves. Um, at some point, you may move from engagement to partnership. At partnership, you're going to serve on a board of directors. You're going to become so knowledgeable about a cause that you can stand up in front of a room full of people and advocate for that particular cause. That room of people might be SAC. That room of people might be your teams. That room of people might be Congress at some point in your life. Um, you have the power, you've educated yourself, you've figured out what you care about, you've connected to multiple causes, you've narrowed it down, you've engaged in that cause, and now you've partnered. You're part of it. Um, that's your journey. And that journey might take two years, and it might take 20 years, and that's fine. It'll take as long as it takes for you personally, and your journey is different from every other person on this call. Um, and it's gonna extend well beyond your college days. At some point, um, and there's a big bold dotted line there, um, you may choose to do something on your own. Um, and as we, as we work with professional and Olympic athletes, we tell them that you know, 99.9% .9 of them have no business starting their own foundations or in their own organizations. Um, but there are alternatives to that. And so we have a best practices program to make sure that if you're going to go in that direction, 
you do it well. So let's get educated. Let's discover what we care about. Let's connect to causes that make sense. Let's narrow that to causes that we are passionate about and want to do a deeper dive around, at which point we engage and partner. Um, so um, happy to answer questions about that. We have an entire workshop that revolves around each step of the causeway. Um, but um, Marissa and Didi thought that it was important that you guys have that roadmap um, and are able to sort of connect your own journey um, to something that sort of has some logical steps. I have the incredible opportunity to work with student athletes across all the, the programs, the nine programs that were listed. And we honestly had too many to choose from. So we just pulled three examples for you. On the left, the um, USC United Black Student Athlete Association just launched in the spring. Um, and they put together a really cool campaign on campus. They created a logo and um, coordinated with Black Lives Matter and LGBTQIA activists to create a backpack that went out to every student athlete at USC. Um, the top two photos are from Michigan State. The gal in the middle there with the green shirt hugging on the girl with orange, she is Bailey. She is a uh, field hockey player. She's since retired from field hockey and graduated. But um, when she first started at uh, Michigan State, St. Baldrick's was a campaign and a cause that was really important to her. And so she worked to fundraise individually and raised, I think, around $7,000 her first year. And within two years, she had actually coordinated efforts across all of Michigan State athletics. And in her final year in 2019, the entire athletics department created an Instagram account. They fundraised as a group for St. Baldrick's. And on the right, she got teammates and coaches involved, and they raised over $45,000. So again, it's not always about fundraising, but in this case, they were really successful in engaging folks in their purpose and passion. And then Georgetown Lightweight Rowers, just a great example. Again, over the summer during COVID, we saw a lot of student athletes who reached out and said, I wanna do more, I wanna get involved. And they really wanted to address food insecurity in the DC area. They put together a social media campaign that we then helped share as part of our recognition. And you know, part of our mission is to highlight the work that you all do. So um, with all their efforts, they raised over $4,000 for the Capital Area Food Bank, and that actually fed 15,000 people. So a very tangible outcome from their fundraiser. We just wanted to share these with you because these were not things that we did. These were athlete-driven um, uh, opportunities to connect to movements that were passionate. So we just think there's so many great opportunities uh, for all of you, and we want to be a resource to you if you choose to do so. Um, I'll talk briefly and, and ask Ivan to close this out, but we've got on social media at Athletes for Hope, a way to connect with us. Um, and just, we've got virtual opportunities like this. We're doing service already. If you look at our social media, you'll see some great examples, but you've got the action plan template. You've got the ideas. And I know we're all super inspired by the work that you do. So um, Ivan or Jason, do you have anything else you want to add before we close out to Marissa? Nope, I just want to thank everyone um, for your participation, for your passion, um, and for your commitment um, to um, leaning in heavily during um, challenging times. That we, we have an opportunity together um, to really make sure this is a movement and not a moment. Um, and we are honored, candidly, um, to be able to participate with you, um, the NCAA, and you, student athletes, in this journey. So. Um, thank you very much. And um, with that, Marissa, we'll turn it back over to you. We're going to keep it going. We're not done early. Sorry to, to break it to you. We are going to transition to our next organization and speakers. But to introduce them, I am going to turn it over to Braley. My name is Braley Keller, and I'm a recent graduate of Nebraska Wesleyan University, where I competed in football and swimming and studied mathematics and education. And I am currently the chair of the D3 National SAC. And right now, I'd just like to thank Ivan and Jason and Suzanne for your time. Uh, this presentation was super, super clear and very direct with the opportunity that we have. So I appreciate that. And really, the big takeaway uh, for me that, that stuck out was being a leader when it's not popular. And the, the go-to phrase, especially right now, is let this be 
a movement, not a moment. And I think that's, that's so true because right now it's, it's probably pretty popular to be speaking up on these issues. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to join the crowd when a, when a lot of people are speaking up on the, on the tough things, but you know, months down the road, we want to make sure that this is still something that, that we're voicing. If, if you are all in on this, this is something you need to be committed to. And that goes into um, the integrity part of it, doing, doing things when it isn't popular, when, when people aren't watching. And that integrity bleeds into the hope and the opportunity that, that was preached through this whole presentation. And, and really, I think that's the challenge for us as student athletes is when we find that thing that we're passionate about, you've got to go for it. And I know we, we understand it as student athletes in our sport that you, you make an all in commitment, but just something that um, I want to give to you guys as a little piece of encouragement too, is um, I also, I should say, I also studied history in undergrad. So I'm a big history guy. So take you back to the sixth century in Europe. Uh, we had some missionaries coming from Ireland and they took a boat over to Scotland. And obviously they were passionate about what they were doing, but they were so passionate and so all in on the effort that they were doing that they literally burned their boats so that they had no, no, no way to go back to their homeland. And that's the sort of all in mentality that I want to encourage for all of you. If, if you find that thing that you're passionate about, You've got to be all in without a doubt. Burn, burn those boats that you've got and commit to it. And, and right now we have the resources um, clearly outlined. And I definitely want to encourage you to um, follow, follow up with the Athletes for Hope um, resources that they've provided. So thank you again so much for that. And now I'm super excited to turn it over to our next organization and speaker. Um, it is RISE, and that's a national nonprofit that educates and empowers the sports community to eliminate racial discrimination, champion social justice, and improve race relations. Through partnerships and programs, RISE inspires leaders in sports to create positive change on matters of race and equality. As Vice President of Curriculum, Dr. Andrew McIntosh helps realize RISE's initiatives by supporting the design, delivery, and evaluation of curriculum and educational opportunities for varying audiences and contexts. Previously, he worked in the business sector for over 15 years, leading the implementation of organizational development and initiatives and developing performance management along with training and development strategies. Please join me in welcoming Andrew. Hi, hey, good, good evening. Um, pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank Marissa and the NCAA uh, for inviting RISE to be a, a part of this discussion uh, and a part of this presentation. I think certainly we, we are uh, in, a, in a, you know, a really pivotal moment in time as we think about civic engagement more broadly uh, and the platform that athletes and specifically um, based on our discussion tonight, student athletes have to make a difference um, we've been having a lot of conversations uh, ac across the country with student athletes about the platform they have, the ways in which they can be more civically engaged. Um, so I'd like to begin by, by sharing a little bit about RISE. So what we're going to cover tonight, um, really quickly, I'll introduce RISE. we get into a quick activity. Um, we'll have a, a little bit of a discussion with Ari Berman, a, a guest presenter with us, um, and then we'll um, walk you through the process of getting registered to vote. So, you know, one of the things that you can do, one of the action steps you can take um, is certainly getting registered and using your voice. And we're hoping that our time here with you tonight really underscores the importance of doing that. Um, RISE, um, just based on the introduction that you heard, uh, we are nonprofit. We believe that we can end racism. Um, Certainly, it won't be in the next five or 10 years, but one day we believe it can be eliminated. And when it is eliminated, we believe that athletes uh, and sport would have played a, a pivotal role, a central role in, in realizing that goal and realizing that aim. So that's, that's what we hope to do. That's what we aim to do. You're going to see a voting rights timeline. It allows you to see a couple of pivotal moments as you know, Americans struggled for the right to vote uh, and use their voice. 
And you're going to be asking yourself these three questions. Which moment really stood out to you? Were there any moments that surprised you? And in what way might these moments influence your understanding of your right to vote now? What I'm going to ask is one person to just share your thoughts to me. So if you can share what moments stood out to you, maybe one that surprised you, and how you think it might influence your understanding of the right to vote right now. One thing that really stood out to our group was the um, 1964 enactment of the Civil Rights Act and um, something, two, two of the biggest things were one, um, I don't, I personally believe many people in the nation as a whole understand that like, parents saw in their lifetimes not having the right to vote and then having the right to vote. So then also in the grand scheme of things, it's kind of crazy to think that a lot of young people our age just two generations ago are saying, you know, we don't want to vote anymore when in the grand scheme of history, we kind of just got that right to vote. Um, and then we also talked a lot about how um, change takes a lot of time on all fronts. You know, um, everything that's really been momentous has happened in the last 100 or so years, given how long, again, history is in the grand scheme of human time. And um, just a lot is rapidly happening. And um, just crazy that it's taken as long as it has to get to the point where we are now. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Thanks a lot for sharing, Alex. Um, yeah, you're, you're spot on. It, it has certainly been very recent in our history that a lot of these things has come to pass. Uh, and we have Ari Booman here with us. He's a journalist and an and author. Um, he's been doing a lot of these conversations with us as we've moved around the country. So I, I'd like him to speak a little bit more about the history, where we are currently, um, and, and then we're going to get into the registration portion. So thanks again, Ari, for joining us tonight. I'll turn things over to you. Hey, Andrew, uh, and thanks so much for, for having me. Thank you to Marissa. Thank you to the NCAA uh, for doing this. And I, I've really been great to um, partner with RISE and, and give these kind of talks. Um, I've been covering voting rights as a journalist for the past decade, uh, and my two big passions in life are voting and sports. And so it's been really cool to see those two things uh, come together. And uh, we are really at an unprecedented moment in our society when athletes and student athletes are realizing that they can no longer stick to sports, quote unquote, that there's so much going on that they have to address. And if you saw that video that the Milwaukee Bucks did, where they talked about the shooting of Jacob Blake, the last thing they said was remember to vote on November 3rd. And so voting is a really key component of the change that athletes and student athletes want to see right now. So I wanna give a little bit of history in the brief time we have and then talk a little bit about where we are today when it comes to voting. A few weeks ago on August 6th was the 55th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the country's most important voting rights and civil rights law. And a few weeks before that, we lost the great civil rights leader, John Lewis, the longtime congressman from Georgia who did more than any other person to fight for voting rights. And I was really lucky uh, to know John Lewis, to write about him. And one of the amazing things about John Lewis was how young he was when he got involved in the civil rights movement. John Lewis was 17 when he met Rosa Parks, who led the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955. John Lewis was 18 when he first met Martin Luther King. He was 20 when he led the sit-in movement in Nashville. He was 21 when he led the Freedom Rides that desegregated bus travel all across the South. He was 23 when he was the youngest speaker at the March on Washington. We just celebrated on Friday the, the 57th anniversary of the March on Washington. And John Lewis was 25 years old when he led the, the March for Voting Rights in Selma, Alabama, which led to the passage of the Voting Rights Act. So John Lewis didn't wait for anybody to name him a civil rights leader. He saw injustice and at your age, the same age you guys are now, he said he was gonna do something to try to change that. When John Lewis marched in Selma on March 7th, 1965, only 156 of 15,000 African-Americans in Selma were registered to vote. There were a lot of ways African-Americans were prevented from registering. There were literacy tests. If you wanted to register to vote, you had to name all 67 county judges to get on the voting rolls. There were poll taxes. You had to actually pay to register to vote every two or four years, which many people could not afford to do. There were property requirements. You had to own land to be able to register to vote. But many African-Americans could not own land and therefore could not vote. 
There were young civil rights activists like Andrew Goodman and James Cheney and Michael Schwerner who went down to Mississippi in 1964 for Freedom Summer and were murdered by the Ku Klux Klan simply for trying to register people to vote. And the reason why there was a march from Selma to Montgomery in March of 1965 was because in the county next to Selma, a young 25-year-old unarmed black man named Jimmy Lee Jackson was killed by Alabama state troopers during a civil rights march. So there's a lot of parallels between things that happened back then and the things that we're seeing today. When John Lewis marched in Selma, Alabama, he was brutally beaten by Alabama state troopers with uh, tear gas and nightsticks and bull whips. And actually ABC News broke into their coverage of Bloody Sunday in Selma, Alabama. And they broke into a film about Nazi Germany called Judgment at Nuremberg. And many people were so confused by the images from Selma that they thought that they were seeing images instead from Nazi Germany. And so eight days after that march, on March 15, 1965, Lyndon Johnson introduced the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And he said that the right to vote was not a Democrat versus Republican issue. It was not a Black versus white issue. It was not a Southern versus Northern issue. It was an American issue. It was a moral issue. That in his words, it was wrong, deadly wrong, to prevent any of your fellow Americans from voting. And so the Voting Rights Act really made America a democracy for the first time. Because before the passage of the Voting Rights Act, you had an entire segment of society, an entire region of the country who were disenfranchised. And so the Voting Rights Act got rid of the literacy tests and the poll taxes and all those things that prevented African Americans from registering. It sent federal officials to the South to register black voters for the first time. And it required those states with a long history of discrimination to actually have to approve their voting changes with the federal government so they didn't discriminate in the future. So the Voting Rights Act was transformative. It laid the groundwork for the first African Americans, the first Latinos, the first Asian Americans, the first Native Americans to be elected in many places. And it changed white politicians too, because you no longer had to play the race card if you wanted to get elected. That said, unfortunately, Voter suppression is not a thing of the past. That especially in the past decade, we've seen a concerted effort to make it harder to vote in some places. Half the states in the country have changed their voting laws in one way or another to make it harder to vote. By requiring strict forms of ID to vote, or cutting back on early voting, or not allowing you to register to vote online. For example, in Texas, there's a law that says you can vote with a gun permit, but not a student ID. There are things like that that explicitly target students. Then in 2013, the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act and said that those states with the longest histories of discrimination, places like Alabama and Mississippi and Georgia, no longer had to approve their voting changes with the federal government. So I'm sure you guys saw during the primaries that there were six hour lines in Georgia. That didn't happen by accident. Georgia closed over 200 polling places in the last six years. And it's unfortunate that in the same way that there are disparities in the criminal justice system, there are disparities when it comes to voting. That Blacks and Hispanics are forced to wait twice as long as whites to vote. So just because you don't have a problem voting doesn't mean that others aren't affected by it. And right now we're in an unprecedented situation with a pandemic. And people have a lot of questions about voting because this election is going to be different than all other elections. We've never held a presidential election in the middle of a pandemic. I just want to talk to you a little bit about how to vote now. A lot of people are going to vote by mail. That is still the safest way to vote in a pandemic. There's a lot of disinformation about voting by mail. But the fact is, voting by mail is not new. The military has been voting by mail for decades. States like Oregon have been voting by mail for decades. It works very well in those places. Voting by mail is not partisan. The parties use vote by mail equally, Republicans and Democrats. And voting by mail is not subject to major voter fraud. And in 44 states, you can vote by mail for any reason. So it's actually very easy to do so in most states of the country. That said, I'm sure you guys have heard about delays with the post office. So if you are going to vote by mail, do it early. Make sure to request your mail ballot at least 15 days before the deadline. Mail it back at least a week before the deadline. Drop it off if you can. A lot of states have drop boxes for mail voting. Sign it carefully. Make sure you sign it. So many ballots are thrown out, especially for young people, because they don't send it back in time or they don't figure out how to sign their ballot carefully. So that said, voting by mail is easy if you're proactive about doing it. But a lot of people are still going to vote the traditional way, which is to vote in person. 
The problem is that so many states have closed polling places because of the pandemic because they can't recruit enough poll workers. The majority of poll workers are over 60 and they're high risk. So we need young people. We need young people like yourself to register and sign up as poll workers. And there's a site called powerthepolls.org where you can sign up to be a poll worker. One really cool thing that sports teams are starting to do is they're starting to donate their voting sites as as uh, their arenas and their stadiums as voting sites, which is really significant because there haven't been enough polling places right now. So all of these NBA teams are saying that we're gonna donate our arenas and stadiums so there's not long lines at the polls. And NBA players and others are saying change has to start with us. Uh, Doc Rivers, the coach of the LA Clippers recently said, only 20% of NBA players were registered to vote. And that was a shocking statistic to me. Uh, I cover voting rights for a living. I think that everyone uh, is registered. But clearly, even very influential people had not been registered to vote. So Doc Rivers told his team and said to the NBA, we need you guys to register and set an example. And the same thing is with you, that athletes, student athletes, you guys have a huge platform. You have an incredible amount of power. So the first thing you guys need to do is make sure you register to vote. Then encourage people to vote. Lead by example. Then give them facts about voting. Tell them that vote by mail is safe if you, if you want to be proactive. Tell them you can vote in person, but we need people to register and volunteer as poll workers and help spread that message. Because what we've learned throughout history is that voter suppression has like been a key tool used to preserve white supremacy. And that if we want to try to start to end racism, try to untangle this legacy of, of white supremacy, voting is not the only way to do so, but it's a key step in that process. And Martin Luther King once said, that the vote isn't the ball game, but it gets you in the arena. So I would urge all you guys to get into the arena and be part of the change that we need to see. Thanks so much, Andrew. And I'll kick it back to you and then to Shada. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Ari. Um, and so, you know, Ari does a really good job of, you know, contextualizing where we are, this moment we are in. And I think he, he rightfully says, you know, we, we have an opportunity, you have an opportunity um, to use your voice, use your platform, use... You're right, uh, and a right that was very hard earned. Um, so I, I like to hand it over to Shadow. Um, he leads our, our Rise to Vote program uh, at Rise. Um, he goes across the country and, and gets people registered, walks them through that process. So I'll hand it over to you, Shadow, um, to you know help folks on the call get registered if it, they would like to do so. Thank you so much, Andrew. And again, thank you, Ari. Um, thank you for everyone at the NCAA and Marissa. We really appreciate this opportunity. Um, as Andrew mentioned, um, we're going to do a quick walkthrough of what it looks like to register to vote. Um, we use Rise to Vote Turbo Vote. Um, Turbo Vote is one of many online tools that are available to folks nowadays, like Rock the Vote or Vote.org. Um, we really like, really like using Turbo Vote because of its really easy use. Um, so I'm going to drop this link in if anyone would like to go along, if you want to register to vote, or if you want to see how it, it's done, and you can do the same walkthrough as I go through it. Um, and it's going to be really quick. Um, we like, again, TurboVote because uh, it sends you reminders. So if you decide to opt in either via text or via uh, email, what they will do is once you register to vote, they will send you reminders uh, weeks out uh, before the registration to check on your registration with your um, local board of elections or your local secretary of state's office. And then when the elections are actually coming up, you know, two, three days advance, they're going to remind you to get out there and decide how you're going to vote, whether that's in mail, in person. So TurboVote is really great for that. Um, really quick note, um, if you're using TurboVote um, and you're going to do this, it's really handy to have a driver's license or a state ID. Um, these are not absolute requirements for every single state, but it does make the process a lot easier. Um, in addition, as Ari mentioned before, there are 40 states that allow for online voter registration. So there are 10 states currently that do not. This is the list of states right here that you can see. Um, so if you wanted to you know, register in one of those states, most likely you would have to print out a paper form from your local board of elections or for, from your secretary of state's website. Um, you would actually have to fill that out with a pen and paper. Sometimes they let you do it as a PDF fill-in online, but you will actually have to have that printed. You will have to sign it and give it what they call a wet signature, and then you will have to sign it, uh, excuse me, you have to send it to the requisite party. Um, TurboVote will tell you exactly where you have to send it and who you have to send it to. So once you finish filling out the form, um, that's what you have to do. And so now I'm going to take you all to the uh, TurboVote website just so you can see what it looks like if you hit that link. So if you go to the link, you'll see this. It says Rise to Vote. We make voting easy. You'll hit Get Started. You'll fill out your name. If you have a middle name, you should put it on there, especially if it's on your official ID. 
Um, you can put in a nickname if you want to, it's not necessary, but it's just how they'll actually refer to you if you do the, the um, text or the email reminders. See, and this is where you put in the number. If you want to opt in for text reminders and um, an email or a number are necessary. So if you want to do both, you can do both, but you will have to put one of them in there. And after that, you'll hit continue. And it'll ask you, are you registered to vote, right? I'm already registered to vote, so I would usually hit yes, but for the purposes of this you know, presentation, I'm just gonna say, no, I'm not sure. And then it's gonna ask you for your address. And this is very important because this is how it's gonna bring up the, in the proper state for you to register in. All right. You're gonna enter that info and when you hit continue, as you can see, it automatically pulls up the state that you're supposed to register for, or register in. It says New York, as I put in New York and my zip code was in New York. And I'm gonna say, I'll register online because that's available to me in my state. When that happens, what you will see is a new tab come up, right? And it automatically takes me to the New York State DMV website because that is where people in New York State um, have to go to in order to register to vote online. So depending on what state you're from or what state you're trying to register in, this will look different for everyone. Again, for me, it's gonna be New York State. Um, a lot of states ask for the same information and so this will look very similar. Again, it, the, the outlook and the interface might look different, but they will be asking for some of the same information, right? What's your New York State driver's license, permit or non-driver ID number? Um, if you do not have a, a driver's license or a permit, or a non-driver ID number, a lot of times they'll ask you for your social security number or for the last four of your social security. Um, New York also asks for a document number, which is just an extra number on your ID. Um, they'll ask for date of birth, zip code. See again, last four digits of social security. Then they'll ask for an address, right? An email address, or um, sometimes they'll ask for a phone number. That's really good to put in there because if there are any errors whatsoever on your registration, you want for folks to be able to reach out to you so you can get that cured, right? Um, and there's a lot of issues sometimes that come up when people send things in or when people send it through the um, online voter registration websites. And so you wanna make sure that's correct. Um, so if you fill out everything correctly, you would hit I agree and I would hit submit, right? And after I hit submit, New York State would be like, okay, Shadow, you're registered, you're good, all right? After that, I would head back to the Turbo Vote website, which is the tab right there. And I would say, yes, I finished the online voter registration process. If you say no for whatever reason, they'll take you back to the beginning and try to cure some of the things that might've been an issue, or they'll see if like your, your state did not have online voter registration available. So I'll put yes. Then I'll ask you, what's your party? This is very important for states that have closed primaries. So a closed primary state means that if you wanna vote um, in the primary for a particular party, you will have to elect to be affiliated with that party. So if this was back um, a couple of months ago before the Democratic National Convention, for example, um, you wanted to, to try to vote for one of the candidates that were um, going for president in the Democratic um, party, you would have had to elect Democrat, right? So that you could also uh, take part in the primaries again, this is not for every state, but you should check out to see if your state is a closed primary state because it's very important. If you wanna vote in primaries, you will have to choose an affiliation. Uh, for the purposes of this, I'm just gonna hit other. And then we'll hit continue. And you see automatically, uh, the general election is on November 3rd, 2020. So that's a red letter date for everyone. Keep that in your mind. Um, keep that um, in, in top of mind for everything that you do now. November 3rd is the general election day. Um, then it asks if you're gonna you know, plan to cast your ballot at the polls or by mail. Um, regardless of the decision, it's just gonna require some extra information for um, TurboVote to give to you. So that's why they ask you that question. So I'm just gonna put by mail. And then it says, there are specific states that um, are asking for um, an excuse if you have an absentee or a mail-in ballot. Um, and so New York is one of them that asks for you to provide an excuse and that's why it has this layout. Um, so I would put temporary illness, for example, if I was um, anxious about you know, COVID um, and the health crisis that's happening and I didn't want to vote at the polls and then I would hit continue. After that, this is just a confirmation screen. It would just tell you all the things that you needed to do or that you would have done. Um, so you just want to make sure that everything is checked off and then like I said, get ready to vote. Um, so there are a lot of different ways that you can do that, um, but I hope that this is one of them that you take heed to. Um, but if anyone has any questions, um, everyone over here at RISE is always available to um, help folks through with their registration. And so if that was something that was too quick or if there was anything confusing, you can always feel free to reach out to us. So just going back, now that you've registered, right? Or now that you've, um, or someone else has registered, you know, what's next for you, right? 
Um, you need to answer a couple of questions because again, this election will be very different than how we've done any election before this. Um, and you wanna have a voter plan to make sure that now that you've registered and now that everything is, is going on, that you wanna be able to actually use your privilege, use your right and be able to cast your vote. So you wanna think about how well I vote, right? Like, is it only in person available in my state? Can I do it by mail? Can I do both, right? Sometimes you can actually have a, um, a ballot mail to you. You can fill it out. And if you feel like taking it in on election day, you can actually take it to your local polling site. Um, when will I vote? Um, as Ari mentioned, early voting is a really great tool for a lot of different states that have it available just so you can miss the crowds and also that, that you can actually get your vote in before election day. Because what you don't wanna do is wait till the last minute as he mentioned before, especially if you're doing mail-in voting. Um, where will I vote, right? So will you be doing that solely through mail-in? Um, are you gonna be doing it from your couch? Will you have the requisite tools? Will you have your actual ballot? Will you be able to send it away? Um, and also um, things are changing quite quickly and quite drastically in every different state. Um, so you want to check, you know, numerous times over and over again what your local polling site is and what access you have to places that are around you in your local area. And then lastly, who will I vote for, right? A lot of questions that we get is, I don't know a lot about the candidates, but you actually have a lot of online resources available to you now, better than any other time in history to be able to research candidates, um, research who's on the ballot and research what they're about. Um, a couple of resources that we highly recommend, Vote 411 is run by our national partner, the League of Women Voters. They are a nonpartisan um, agency and national nonprofit that's been doing this for years. Um, and if you want, what you can do is you can put in your address into this website at vote411.org. And then when you do that, it will provide you with customized nonpartisan election information based on your address. So it'll tell you about whatever elections you have going, whether that's national, state, or local, they will have all of that information. Um, in addition, if you have particular candidates that are going to be there, they actually provide responses and you can actually pair them up next to each other to see what people's platforms are. Election Protection, that's another one of our national partners in the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. Um, if you have any issues at all with your polling site, with your ballot, or if you feel like your rights have been abridged when it comes to voting, you can reach out to them and they have volunteers staffing 24 seven to ensure that people's rights are not being abridged and that you have the full right to vote. And then lastly, if you like Wikipedia like me, you just like clicking links and going down that spiral, Ballotpedia is a great resource for that. They also have nonpartisan information and it is based on your state and your locality. So check those out if you do have an opportunity. I highly recommend them again so that you have the information ready for you in front of you and so that you know who you want to vote for and how you want to vote. We talked a lot about this that you know voting is one piece of the puzzle when it comes to civic engagement and civic action and when we're talking about voting that is one thing that you can do specifically in the political space as well because there are other things that you can do right if there are particular candidates or particular organizations that you really care about that are doing great stuff in the space of voting you can donate directly to them right charity is a great way for you to be able to to show and and, and speak on your voice um, and you can do that with your own dollars and you get a tax break for it which is really great uh, direct action, as Ari mentioned before, a lot of states need poll workers. So that's a great way for you to be in person, to do some volunteerism, if you have the time, if you have the confidence, if you have the effort, um, I highly recommend that. And then the last one is advocacy, right? And that's about speaking out on the issues that are important to you. And in an age of social media where everyone has a platform, um, it's really easy to talk about these things and you can go out there and share your voice and talk about those things. But you can also talk to individuals within your networks, whether they're your loved ones or in your circle, and you can also get them to do the same thing. It is not illegal to help someone to register to vote. Um, and so you can talk about that and tell your friends. And I know that there may be a lot of um, international students at different universities around the country. And so if you know someone that's not eligible to vote, these are some of the ways that they can also get involved. So each one teach one and everyone can bring something to the table. So thank you so much for that opportunity to present to you all. Andrew, I'm gonna hand it back over to you. Again, thank you for, for being here tonight. Um, really wanna uh, thank Marissa and the NCAA for this opportunity. Um, you have a platform, um, one powerful step um, on that platform is getting registered and making sure those around you are registered. So definitely take that small action step. Tons of other things you can do um, as athletes or hope shared with you tonight, but that is one small step that you can take tonight going forward. Thank you very much. Marissa? Um, I hope today instilled a little bit of hope in you all and left you inspired to vote and make a change on your campus and in your communities. If this information that we gave to you stays on this Zoom call, then we didn't do our job. So I hope that you take that out and put it in your group chats to your families, to your teammates, um, register to 
work one of the polls if that's something that you're comfortable with as well. Um, find a way to get involved within your community. Um, but most importantly, continue to educate yourselves, continue to support causes that you care about, and continue to create change. Um, it's been so good to speak with you all each of these Sundays, and I hope that you all are able to take something away from these and really realize the, the power that your voice has. And on those days that you don't feel like your voice has meaning or isn't being heard, know that I hear you and I see you and that think of my little voice in your ear cheering you on to go make the change that I know that you can. So I hope you all have a good rest of your night and a great week and good luck to you all. Take care.